Hello, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sydney Ross. I'm the Outdoor Education Manager for Deep Roots, and we have a wonderful Lunch and Learn episode for you today. Today, Andy Carmack, Private Land Conservationist of MDC, will be joining me. But before we jump in to the history, how to ID and manage invasive autumn olive, I just have a couple of housekeeping notes. First of all, I want to thank our sponsor, Missouri Department of Conservation, for connecting people to nature. Not only do they provide resources to help people manage their large and small landscapes, but they also offer a lot of fun through their naturalist programs at places like the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center and Burr Oak Woods, among other conservation areas and nature centers. I also want to thank donors like you for helping make these programs possible. They bring a lot of joy and foster a lot of community in our, in our area. So thank you for that. As a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and all resources will be available online. Following today's episode, I will email you a resource list, um, including information to contact Andy Carmack if you have any questions about Autumn Olive. Don't forget, put your comments in the chat and let us know if you have any questions in the Q&A. Following today's program, Andy will join us live at the end to answer your questions about managing invasive species. And please visit deeproots.org to find out more about upcoming events, webinars, and native garden resources. And while you're there, consider making a donation. I'd like to go ahead and welcome to the virtual uh, platform, Andy Carmack, private land conservationist from MDC. Uh, if you all have tuned in to our previous Lunch and Learn episodes, you may remember Andy talking about uh, managing calorie pear back in the spring. Hey, Andy, how's it going today? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you. So, Andy, um, autumn olive is uh, actually a plant I am not too familiar with So, uh, because I don't see it as often here in the urban core um, at the Discovery Center. I was wondering if before we jump into today's episode, if you could tell us a little bit about Autumn Olive, uh, the history of it, um, where it comes from, uh, et cetera. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> Autumn Olive is a, is a native shrub to Asia and it's found all throughout the Asian continent there. So that's where it originally came from. It was brought over in about the early 40s and uh, and tried to propagate it, but it really didn't get out until the mid 1960s. And we planted it, we meaning the Department of Conservation planted it and promoted it uh, as a good food for wildlife and the berries are edible for wildlife and for human consumption. So there is that uh, aspect of the autumn olive that <clears throat> isn't that well known, but you can eat it, it is safe for humans, but we promoted it primarily for good wildlife food and cover and people out, especially a little east of here, planted it as living fences and shelter belts around their houses. And it, it uh, well, it's just like all of the other exotic invasive species. It, it has a tendency of really taking off and this is uh, no, no exception. So that's a little bit about that. And it, autumn olive, people often think that Russian olive and autumn olive are the same, and that's not true. Uh, those are two different species. We can get into the, the what each looks like, but for this uh, episode, we're talking about autumn olive specifically. Yeah, thank you for that. I can't wait to, to hear more about uh, the differences between them and uh, to hear how you answer our audience's questions at the end of our program today for the Q&A. So folks, stick around. And if you do have questions for Andy, please put them in the Q&A. Um, otherwise, feel free to engage with the chat as we begin our episode, uh, Lunch and Learn, How to ID and Manage Invasive Autumn Olive. Hi, I'm Andy Carmack. I work for the Missouri Department of Conservation and uh, I'm what you call a private land conservationist. So I go around um, county and landowners in Jackson and Cass County. So that's Kansas City County proper, Jackson, and then Cass, the next one south. And I go and I work with private landowners to 
help them advance fish forests and wildlife resources on their property. So the number one thing that I deal with when I start to meet with landowners and talk to them about the issues and how to make their property better that we always discuss is exotic invasive species. When we talk about exotic invasive species, these are species that don't belong here in Missouri and Kansas. There is a whole list of these species. They outcompete all of our native species. They're just a disaster, ecological disaster. So today is November 7th and it's the end of the growing season and all of the native trees have gone to bed. You can see the dogwood trees here have already dropped their leaves. All of the elms and the sycamores and all of the native trees around have already started to drop their leaves. And the only thing left with leaves would be some of these exotic invasive species. So the exotic invasive species we're going to highlight the control of today is autumn olive. So this is an autumn olive plant here. It is not native. It comes to us based on ornamental tree stock. So they planted this in their landscapes, people did in Kansas City and the surrounding areas. And most of the exotic invasive species start around population cores and then work their way out. So in areas with high occupancy, counties like Johnson County, Kansas, Jackson County, Missouri, they plant, they had these ornamental stocks planted 50, 60, 70 years ago, and olive is, is one of them. There also is calorie pear, your Bradford pears, and your honeysuckles, and all of these exotic species that were planted in ornamental stock, and now they're out, and they're across the landscape. The trees that we're gonna look at today, autumn olive, is characterized by its silver backed leaf. So this is how it grows. This is a branch that I just cut off of this tree species. And if you look at the back of the leaves, the underside of the leaves, and if you can catch them in the sun, they're silver or white. So autumn olive is super easy to identify based on the white underside of their leaves. It's one of the only tree species that has this in the state and it's not supposed to be here. Also, you can look at this and it has beautiful red berries. Now the berries have already dropped off this particular specimen, but what the, happens is the birds love these berries. They eat the berries, they go across the landscape, and here you have autumn olive spread here. And this is an old field situation. It, there's olives scattered throughout this, this um, old field. So it's spread by birds and animals. Uh, it has the silver back leaf. Another identifying characteristic is it is super thorny stem. So when we look at cutting it, you need to keep in mind how thorny these stems can be. So it's just like a, a hedge, a honey locust, um, a pear. So these thorns are super terrible on hands and even long. Look how long this thorn here is. Um, can get three inches long. So they have thorns and a silver back. They're holding their leaves long. Here it is November and it still has viable leaves. Um, <clears throat> they're one of the first to flesh out. They're one of the first plants to have leaves on it in the spring and the very, one of the very last trees to drop their leaves in the fall. So here we are in November. It's super easy to still identify autumn olive. So what we're going to talk a little bit about today is three different ways that you can control olive on your place. So we're going to talk about the three options that you've got for control are basal treatment. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about a cut stump treatment and then we're going to talk about a foliar treatment. But before we get into the actual hands-on and how we're going to do the work, we have to realize that there are some tools in the toolbox that maybe you know about or maybe you don't know about, but herbicide is going to be key on all of these exotic invasive woody species that we're going to talk about today. So autumn olive is a, a woody stem and if you can look at how it grows, it typically grows in a multi-stem fashion like this right here. Uh, it, it's typically very hard based on its thorns. It's not very fun to, to uh, work with. But there are a couple ways to, to handle this autumn olive problem if this happens on your property and you need to deal with it. So 
This autumn olive is about 12 foot tall. Um, one way that you could treat this would be a basil bark application. So we'll talk a little bit about basil bark. Basil bark is a way that we treat exotic invasive species by treating the first 18 inches basically from your knee down to the root with a herbicide formulation, Remedy Ultra or Garlon 4. Now, there are other forms of this herbicide, and I'm not advertising one company over another at all, but triclopyr is the active ingredient in Remedy Ultra. So in order to do a basal application, basal bark application, triclopyr needs to be used. And we mix triclopyr in a basal application at 25% Remedy Ultra triclopyr, 75% diesel fuel. Now that diesel fuel is going to allow that to penetrate the bark and in order to soak through the bark and hold it on the bark in a long period of time. And the mode of killing, the way this kills it, is that bark sucks in the herbicide at a, such a high rate, 25% is a high rate for, for herbicide use, it allows it to suck it in and kill to the root. So the one key that we keep in mind when we start to talk about basil bark application is Remedy Ultra is very expensive. And when I say very expensive, most people are used to buying, say, generic Roundup, something that's cheap. Remedy Ultra is about $80 a gallon. So at a, at a mix of 70 or 25% Remedy Ultra, you're spending a lot of money on herbicide if you're not using the right tools for the job. This is an ultra low volume spray wand. So it has a fan tip that shuts off down here and not up here. So we use the minimum herbicide that is possible in order to kill the most number of stems. For a gallon of Remedy Ultra and diesel fuel mix, you can kill several hundred stems per acre. So it's a super effective tool. It's easier to, to, to spray uh, basil like this when they're super tall. And, and we'll talk about foliar treatment here in a minute, but when the plants get about this tall, you basically have two options and basil bark application is the way to do this. So ultra low volume basil wand, um, Remedy Ultra or some kind of triclopyr. And this product, they get this question a lot. All of the products that we're going to look at today are only going to be available at an ag service dealer. So anywhere that you can get herbicide, um, MFA or CPS or nutrient ag solutions or anywhere that sells good uh, agricultural herbicide is where you're going to have to go to get this. You're not going to be available to buy this at a box store. So go get that. And then the other thing is the label. Every herbicide comes with a label. This label is about 15 to 20 pages. The label is the law so you have to follow the label you have to follow wearing all of your ppe your personal protective equipment on here and on each label it goes into what species it's controlled with and the timing of year so this will give you application methods application rates and species controlled by everyone every herbicide sold in the united states has a specimen label and the label is the law so this is remedy ultra it's going to be the product that we have chosen to do our ultra low volume basal bark treatment. So I told you you need the first 18 inches, so about from your knee down. Now, basal application works on stems that are one inch to six inch diameter. So all of these stems here that you can see are about an inch, maybe an inch and a half in diameter. So it's the right application for this tool. So with our ultra low volume spray wand, we're gonna, we've got our Remedy Ultra and our diesel fuel mixed up. We're gonna come to our knee height level with our ultra low volume spray wand, and we're gonna spray just like that. Just, and the key to this is you wanna make sure you get both sides of the stem, 18 inches, and in the case of this multi-stemmed autumn olive, you need to get both sides of every stem. And that diesel fuel that we added to it will help this plant uptake the herbicide. So you can see with a multi-stem olive tree like this one, basal application 
getting every side of the stem can be difficult and utilize some herbicide. However, that application that you just saw right here would be a totally effective killing mixture for this to kill this olive tree here. So ultra low volume basal application that diesel fuel <clears throat> will suck into that there and you can do this any time of the year as long as the bark's not frozen. So we typically like these uh, actively growing so March, April, May just not really January and February when that bark could be frozen but basal application works good most of the times of the year. So now we're going to look at a different kind of application in order to get rid of your autumn olive. We'll go over to the next tree just right across the landscape here. Also, same tree species, this one's a little bit taller, maybe 15 or 18 foot. Same growing characteristics. So in order to kill this tree, we're going to do what you call a cut stump treatment. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a chainsaw like this one, and I'm going to cut the stem down, and then we're going to get back with you on showing you the proper application of herbicide. Now, for landowners, this right here is the single most dangerous piece of equipment that there is. So if you don't know how to run a chainsaw, I recommend getting a class uh, to do that because this is dangerous. If you don't know how to use this, don't use it. Um, and even the professionals, you need to wear all of the right PPE. So in order for me to run this, I'm gonna cut this tree down here. I'm gonna put on my chainsaw chaps, leather gloves, a hard hat and hearing protection. You need all of those things with good leather boots before you start doing any cut stump application. I told you in the last about 15 minutes ago, this is a super thorny tree. So long sleeves would also be helpful. But for today, I'm gonna cut it down. I'm gonna, with this chainsaw, and we're gonna go ahead and show you how to properly apply and what herbicide to apply on a cut stump treatment for autumn olive. Okay, so you can look at this particular stem that I just cut, and you can see that I tried to get it pretty low here, and that this is how this plant grows, multiple stems. So <clears throat> why I wanted to get it low is so that I could show you the proper application of a product called Tordon RTU. So this is a product that is designed for individual plant treatment, for cut stump treatment of a lot of different species. Now, what people don't know oftentimes is that the only portion of this tree that's actively growing is the cambium layer. So if you look at this part right here, you can see it growing right here. So the outer one half inch of this big piece here is 
the only portion of this stem that's growing. Now, this is all growing, and this is all growing, this is growing. So, I'm going to show you how to do a multi-stem cut stump treatment. Now, Tordon, this product you can buy at a box store. So, this is Tordon RTU, which stands for ready to use. The active ingredient is Picloram. So, when you get your autumn olive cut like this, you want to treat this like that, get that all these surface areas cut and I'll show you how we're going to do the big one in a minute and the, each of these bottles comes with an application tip and you want all of this to actively uptake the herbicide like this okay so now on this big stem here the only portion that was growing is the cambium layer so we just do the outer edge none of this inside needs to be treated it's going that way because of how it was cut at an angle but that's right there proper application technique for Tordon RTU. Remember we talked about the label being the law in judicious herbicide use and using the right tools. This is the right tool for this. And now, this technique can be done 365 days a year as long as it's not frozen. Once again, just like the basil, we don't want frozen bark. But the key to this technique is you really want to treat the stems very shortly after you have cut them so within 15 minutes otherwise what happens is this plant forms a callus over the injury you just injured it by cutting it and thus it will not uptake the herbicide so you want to do timing is important you can do this about any time of the year as long as it's not frozen treat the stump the cut stump treatment with Tordon now this will not come back this is dead to the roots I always like to do as low as I possibly can go without putting my chainsaw into the dirt because sharpening chainsaws is takes some time so this bottle here of herbicide can treat several hundred stems of cut stump treatment so you just saw there's 15 or 20 a quart will run you about $20 so this should be about $20 several hundred stems you can treat cut stump with Tordon RTU so that's the second application and if you noticed I did use my good rubber gloves in order to handle this herbicide which is what you need. Picloram is um, a good herbicide however it is a strong herbicide so use your right PPE. The final technique that we're going to talk about on the autumn olive would be a high volume foliar application and we're going to demonstrate what that's going to look like at our next step. So, like I said earlier, I'm not suggesting or recommending one product over the other. I'm just giving some tips and techniques that have used that I have used in the field for for many years. So, a backpack sprayer like this one would be the recommended way to to apply high volume foliar. And we'll get over here and talk about that. to six inches in diameter so from here to here cut stump can be done on any size tree foliar application needs to be reserved for trees six foot and under like this size would be optimal for a foliar application I already told you that it's super thorny and, and not fun to handle so if you didn't want to handle it this would be your application method so the product I like to use on Autumn Olive is the same product that we used with our basil application, but this is Remedy Ultra. The label's the law, it's on the label. So whenever I get the question, how much do I mix? The answer is whatever the label amount says that you can use. So I don't ever like to answer that. I like to have people do the research, look at the label because the label is the law. Mix it according to the labeled recommendations. And then on plants like this, for a ultra high volume foliar application, you don't need that same spray tip. Any of the tips that come with your backpack or hand pump sprayers 
will work fine for a foliar application like this one. The key is you want to get herbicide on every leaf. So the mode of transportation of herbicide is going to be detected and uptook through the leaves. So you want to play the wind, have all the PPE on, and <clears throat> come up to the plant, less than six foot tall, and you just want to wet the leaves down like this, right? And keep in mind, I got a little bit ambitious. This is water, right? So this is for this, because now's not the right time of year to be spraying autumn olive. So this is water. What you don't want to do is during the active growing season, mix up a tank and just go like this. See how much overspray I'm getting there? That's not what you want. You want to target your application and thus target your dollars because this Remedy Ultra is expensive. You want to save it. You want to treat just the stems and not have the overspray. Not to mention the ecological uh, problems that come with all of the overuse of herbicides. So you want to get this, the plant wet all sides as much as you can, including the top. Now, the reason that I like six foot for my height on my uh, on my foliar application is because I can't reach much taller than that and not have the overspray. I like to spray down like this, but as soon as I try to get that upper stem, you can see that throughout that sun is, is drifting off. So six foot is about the height that, that I like. So in the sun you can see you want to get the plant wet like this, the application just like that. You can get multiple stems, multiple plants with a gallon or two of, of Remedy Ultra. The timing on calorie, not calorie pair, the timing on autumn olive for a foliar application is actively growing. So we want this sprayed May, June, July, last first part of August would be the timing for foliar application like this for autumn olive. So there are lots of resources that are available to you um, in both Missouri and Kansas. I would recommend that if you have exotic invasive species, particularly autumn olive, and you have some additional questions, reach out to those who uh, have done this and have the experience. <clears throat> Wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and welcome Andy back to the virtual stage. Hello again. Hello. Okay, we've got some really great questions in our Q&A, <clears throat> and I'm seeing in our chat too that a lot of folks are dealing with autumn olive. So we're going to go ahead and dive in. So folks, if you have any questions you'd like to ask Andy, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Okay, we're going to start with Nadia's question. Um, she's asking if there are, or mentioning any alternatives to remedy or formulated herbicides. Uh, sh they are using 30% vinegar and in their experience, it works with vines. What are your thoughts, Andy, on, uh, you utilizing alternative methods that are not formulated herbicide? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and since I started this job in 2003, I've seen a, a, a growing trend in, wanting to use less and less herbicides across the landscape. And with that trend comes, you know, the organic, they want to be organic and they want to do things. And, you know, herbicide use, I kind of talked about that in the video. It is, uh, it's, it's, it's a tool, right? And when we start to look at the tools that it's going to take in order to accomplish the job, people don't, some people really don't like herbicide and I, I have to respect that, you know, as, as a private land conservationist, I have to respect all the opinions about herbicide use that there is. However, when we start looking at alternatives towards chemical formulations and, and manufactured formulations like this high molarity or high concentration vinegar, we start to, and you take a deep dive into it, it's, um, you're putting on gigantic amounts of the product at a higher concentration. And when I started researching this about five years ago, you start looking at different varieties and manufacturers. And right now there isn't a label, a label that is safe for chem or safe for vinegar. The acetic acid is the active ingredient in vinegar. There isn't a label that is it's legal to use in Missouri. So when we start talking about 
people using vinegar instead of Roundup because Roundup causes cancer allegedly. You know, the, the, where where people are at on that, I'm I'm no doctor or lawyer, but whatever your beliefs are on that, we also go back to the what I was saying in that is the label is the law, and those those chemical labels they've gone through the EPA, they've gone through a lot of testing. Um, to make them as safe as they can be and utilize the product where that that vinegar hasn't done the same process. Um, and when we start looking at concentrations of whatever it is, whether it's vinegar, acetic acid, glyphosate, triclopyr, to get a, you know, all of the applications that I've seen and talked about on turf grass removal is typically what we what vinegar is attempted at trying to get rid of um, some fescue and some brome. We're talking gallons of vinegar per acre to do to try to do that versus ounces per acre of a of chemically synthetically created herbicide. So you just have to start to do your research and and my personal experience is it's not legal to do so we're at the department of conservation is not going to um, uh, advocate for it what you do on your private property is your business so i'm not here to tell you, you you can't i'm just saying that there are other tools that have worked better um, i have worked with a few landowners who have tried vinegar uh, it does a really good job of top killing uh, especially turf grass it but it does not kill it so that's my personal experience with that. I definitely, uh, on this topic for autumn olive, I would be, um, because it is a woody stem and that wood, that's, that root structure is very well developed versus like a, a, a fescue or sericea, um, I would be very, my, my opinion is, I'd be very skeptical that it would work well. So that's, that's my kind of take right. on that. I appreciate that. <clears throat> and Andy, I think maybe in a prior conversation you and I had about this topic, because it is, it's, you know, a very common recommendation I see on online. Um, <clears throat> but is, is it true that vinegar also impacts the soil long-term compared to some of these herbicides in your, is that? Yeah. So there are negative, you know, you're killing all of your, your micro, um, flora, uh, when you start pouring on that acetic acid, because it is an acid versus, you know, glyphosate is, is not acidic, um, but there are negative environmental and ecological impacts to using it. Uh, and where you're at philosophically on this, you'll have to weigh that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Um, kind of to dovetail the, the herbicide conversation, uh, Tila is asking, what would a local example be of those agriculture stores that sell herbicide that you've mentioned today? Sure. So the local ones would be um, West Central Ag. There's a West Central MFA, a West Central Ag in Odessa, and there's one in Harrisonville. There's a place called Nutrien Ag Solutions that would be in Harrisonville. Those would be three of the local recommendations for places that you could buy that. Van Deest. You can get online and, and Van Deest sells out of Marshall, Missouri. You can call them and they'll ship you the herbicide. Those would be four good uh, ways that you could get that particular herbicide. Wonderful. And folks, uh, I'll be sure to include those four recommendations in the resources that I'll email out following today's program. Um, Andy, can you reiterate the ratio for Remedy Ultra and Diesel? Yeah, so 25% Remedy Ultra, 75% diesel fuel is the rate. 25 triclopyr, 75% diesel fuel or bark oil. Um, either one, just a bark penetrant is what you're looking for there. Wonderful. But the ratio is the same whether you're using bark oil or diesel fuel. 25% okay. active ingredient and 75% your method of making it stick, whether that's bark oil or diesel. Okay. Um, we have uh, a question about uh, prescribed burns from Carla Dodds. Does prescribed burn help with autumn olive control to keep it in check post-treatment? And if so, what's the best time of year to burn autumn olive? Yeah, so it is going to, prescribed fire typically does a really good job of top killing a lot of the woody stems. As far as uh, killing them all, you're going to have to have a massive 
fuel load of native warm season grasses around the stems, the actual stems. And when you start looking at a multi-stem like uh, a species like the autumn olive that we were looking at in the video series, you know, when you start getting eight or 10 stems there, you're gonna have to have a lot of fuel, really tall native warm season grass to get that hot enough to burn those stems. So if the question is post-treatment, will fire be good for autumn olive? The answer is it can be yes, but you have to do consistent burning and the stems have to be individual stems less than the size of your finger uh, in order to get it controlled with fire. When you start getting these big, you know, six and eight foot tall uh, shrubs, fire is not going to be, it'll top kill them. It won't kill them to the root. Mm, okay. That, that's really great insight. Thank you. Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Are there any plans for MDC to eradicate autumn olive from their land? I live by bush wildlife in St. Charles and drive by huge stands in and along the way. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so like I referenced at the in introduction, the Department of Conservation propagated and planted and promoted, and we have a lot of it on our Department of Conservation areas. We have over, between all the conservation areas combined, over a million acres. Uh, not all of that is suitable, of course, and has autumn olive, but a lot of it does. And as far as does the department, um, have a plan for exotic invasive species control, you bet we do. It's one of our biggest uh, expenditures on our managing of our state land, uh, whether it's just, there's so much of it and there's so many of these species that, and staff time and money are both uh, limiting factors on what we can get done. But all of the state land, all the state land managers are required to try to control exotic invasive species on their conservation areas. So. I know that Bush is, is like where I'm at, the James A. Reed area over here on the Kansas City side. Uh, there's a lot of exotics here and we just, they, they do what they can with what they have. Understandable. And sometimes you gotta, well, not sometimes, you always need to prioritize your goals, projects and resources. So um, I know that you all are doing the best that you can. Okay, I have another question. <clears throat> From Haley, if you have just a few small autumn olives on your property and don't want to use herbicides, would digging them up be a viable option to remove them? Yes. So if they're small, like less than three quarter of an inch, um, you can pull them uh, when the soil's kind of wet in the spring. As long as you get the majority of that root system, uh, mechanical will work. The What happens and it's we've been i'm not beating a dead horse but this is a multi-stem it just it sends 10 and 8 stems up and once it gets those get you know you get a multi-stemmed plant pulling them up is going to be impractical could you root dock them you, you could yeah you could yeah because yeah. that yeah i've i was just just thinking about that like if you can't physically dig up the whole mm -hmm. I, yeah just thinking like if you can get your shovel and at an angle and get cut that root and then remove it. I wonder if that would be useful. Yeah. Okay. We have, um, we've got one more question. So it's slightly off topic, but I know you're the expert here. So I thought it would be appropriate to ask you, Andy. Um, David is asking for an effective way to kill Johnson grass. Okay. Johnson grass is spread by seed and rhizome. So it requires a specialty herbicide called Outrider. Outrider is sold in a granular formulation. It's sold by the pound. It's super expensive, but a you know you're, you we're talking application rates of two ounces per acre. So if you have an acre of Johnson grass, uh, if you use Outrider, you only need two ounces per acre. So a pound will give you eight acres worth. Uh, it's the industry standard. It works uh, very well. You need to hit it before now because now the the plant is putting on the seed head and it's getting mature. It's a warm season grass, um, so it's getting mature now. The timing would be right around that May in middle of May, first part of June would be the time that you would really want to get on that Johnson grass when it's about 18 inches tall. In um, outrider at two ounces per acre is the industry standard on that. 
Well, and I know in my limited experience working with Johnson Grass, if it's really small areas, like at the Discovery Center, we have a pretty good time pulling it. But since this is uh, pertaining to large landscapes and landowners, which I know um, jo our friend Joe is, um, and some of our others tuning in, that's super helpful to, to know because it makes a big difference having the right tools for the job, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Okay, we actually got one more question that popped into the chat, um, or the the Q and A rather. Liz is asking if you have any recommendations on how to get rid of perilla. Uh, so that would be perilla mint. Um, I have not had any experience doing that. I don't know what. I don't even know what a good uh, recommendation would be. You know, we would need. I'd need to do the research um, shooting off the hip on that. I would say since it's a broad leaf, uh, either pasture guard or remedy would probably be my picks, but I, I would look at the label and make sure. I think that triclopyr and fluoroxapyr, that pasture guard mix would be, if you made me pick one, I think it would probably be that one um, as far as the control of that perilla. But yeah. I don't know. I have not had any experience in doing that. Yeah, I um, I also do not have experience with it other than seeing it while I'm hiking. But, you know, I just had an idea, too. Um, it, since I just looked it up, it is an annual. So something that I like to recommend, especially in smaller landscapes, is if you have a species that you're trying to uh, decrease the amount of, uh, get cut the seed head off, cut the flower off before it goes to seed, especially with the annual that might be really helpful. Um, but yeah, that's a thank you for that insight onto that, Andy. And it just goes to uh, kind of reinforce the importance of doing your research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, you all thank you for joining us today for our lunch and learn. Uh, Andy, you were wonderful. We really appreciate your expertise. So I hope you all will tune in to our next episode of Native Plants at Noon on Thursday, July 18th at noon. We have an exciting uh, presentation with Cassandra Messer, private land conservationist of Missouri Department of Conservation. We will be taking a look at Platte Ridge Park, where we visited to compare what it looks like to be in a turf area versus native habitat. Um, it may or may not shock you to see the difference between these two types of landscape. So if you, if you will tune in with us in a couple of weeks, we will be back for that episode. Keep an eye out. Um, I will be sending you an email following today's program with resources discussed in today's show. And if you don't mind completing a brief survey to let us know how we did today, I'd be grateful. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.